Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching TheAnalysis.News. You're watching part one of my discussion with political economist Patrick Bond on the BRICS countries and what they represent. These discussions are made possible by your con contributions, however big or small. So if you're in a position to donate, please do go to our website, TheAnalysis.News, and hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. You can get onto our mailing list so that you're notified every time there's a new episode. And like and subscribe to our podcast on whichever podcast platforms you use. And you can also like, subscribe, and hit the bell on our YouTube channel, The Analysis Hyphen News. See you in a bit for my discussion with Patrick Bond. Joining me now is Patrick Bond. He's a political economist and professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg. He directs the Center for Social Change. He's also the author of numerous books, including Bricks, an Anti-Capitalist Critique, which he wrote together with Anna Garcia. It's really great to have you here today, Patrick. Uh, thanks for the chat, uh, Talia. Good. The BRICS countries recently got together at the BRICS Summit in Johannesburg, South Africa at the end of August. And in response to the summit, you wrote a piece characterizing the BRICS as being sub-imperialist, so they're not even a halfway house to neoliberalism, but they're fully integrated in a neoliberal economic system. So would you say that this perception or characterization of the BRICS as forming a new alternative to the Bretton Woods institutions or being opposed to the U.S. dollar hegemony is, in fact, completely unfounded? Well, Talia, you know, a lot of the, the terrain on which we are operating here is what we could call talk left, walk right. And that means that there's a tendency to try to get popular support for some uh, process and to dress it up as if it is uh, in some populist mode uh, going to help ordinary people. Uh, the reality is that the elites get stronger and stronger, and often they do so using uh, all rhetoric of alternatives. But the harsh reality, once you get the devil in the details into your uh, radar screen, is that nearly everything that the BRICS have been doing, and some of the key countries like South Africa, which although it's the smallest in population and in uh, e economic size, has uh, a certain um, historic uh, function and credibility given that we've come out of apartheid by fighting imperialism and its support for white sub-imperialist South Africa. The dilemma is that there are so many continuities, not changes, especially in economic interests. So as Samir Amin put it, the sub-imperialism of South Africa um, rests upon the failure of our government to make changes away from an economic structure that has been grounded in a minerals energy complex, or as he put it, the monopoly capitalism of Anglo-American and, and the, the mining houses. And um, while there have been some changes and there's a bit of deracialization at the top, nevertheless, the basic economic structure has amplified oppression and what we would call super exploitation. It's not even just the worker at the point of production in a factory. It's all the other terrains, the gender um, oppression that goes with long distance migrant labor, the ecological uh, appropriation, non-renewable resources stripped from the ground. And that's why the term sub-imperialism has become popular because as the originator, Hoy Mauro Marini, a Brazilian a dependency theorist who was writing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, he devised an understanding of Brazil after the coup in 1964 in which it fits into imperialism's expansion as a key nation. And the um, antagonistic cooperation with the West shouldn't Un, uh, shouldn't veil uh, the real politic uh, in which the monopoly capital and finance capital structures of those economies uh, need to also expand. But they have certain uh, limitations and they therefore have um, antagonisms with the West. But they're not against Western neoliberal capitalism. They're within it. And what we find indeed is that they actually amplify it. And that's why uh, when I hear talk left I look for the walk right, and I wish many more uh, who think BRICS is an alternative would do so as well. Well, another example of the walk right would potentially be the declaration that they published. Some of the articles um, in that dec declaration state that they would like to have a broader role or, or greater representation within the Bretton Woods institutions themselves, such as the IMF and the World Bank. So that doesn't seem like they're 
trying to fight that system at all. They actually want to have a greater role within it. So that begs the question, what is then the purpose of different financial mechanisms they've created, such as the uh, contingency reserve arrangement and the other development bank that they have? Well, you're right. Let's take that in two steps. One is the attempt to reform. The other is to figure out alternative institutions. And the attempt to reform included actually purchasing a greater share of the major recapitalization of the International Monetary Fund. So I'm sure all your viewers know that this is the institution which is the main policeman for the interests of, of world finance. They, they force countries, including South Africa today, to squeeze their budgets in order to uh, be able to repay foreign lenders, even when those loans are demonstrably corrupt. Or in our case, we also have very high loan uh, commitments to repaying coal-fired power plant debt that the World Bank especially led on about 12 years ago. And so there's odious debt and it's corrupt debt. Um, and the IMF lends uh, so that we have uh, money to pay the interest on the old debt. It's a typical function of balancing the uh, payments. The, the World Bank does project loans. Now, uh, as far as I've seen, the, the uh, BRICS block and their delegates have done absolutely nothing to change that division of labor, that way in which the IMF and the World Bank oppress poor countries. The project loans, like South Africa's biggest loan and the World Bank's biggest loan ever, the $3.75 billion Madupi coal-fired power plant loan, are often very anti-people and they're certainly anti-environment. And yet repaying them requires new money. So the IMF regularly goes and says, we, we want new money from our members. And the last time they did that, 2015, they got um, from China a 37% increase in China's voting shares by buying uh, more, more of uh, the sort of IMF's capital base. And for Brazil, it was 23. For India, 11. For Russia, it was 8. Now, when they buy more, of course, some, some people lose because they can't afford it. And those would be Nigeria and Venezuela, each losing 41%. So yes, the BRICS have done some reforms of what they call voice. They have a louder voice. The BRICS together aren't, uh, uh, you know, quite fifteen percent. Uh, that's the sort of veto level for making loans. The U.S. regularly exercises that or uses its power in the IMF. In fact, it was unveiled that it made a loan Pakistan because the U.S. pushed the IMF to do so in order that Pakistan would sell weapons to Ukraine. So it's that sort of let's say functional in imperialist politics, not just economics. And there, when we have a reform effort, you'd expect the IMF maybe to be a little bit more pro-BRICS, and instead of having a, Euro a European as its managing director, then there may be a more uh, openness. But instead, the BRICS delegates uh, voted again and again for uh, what were dis demonstrably corrupt IMF leaders. I say that without hesitation or fear of any lawyers, because they were convicted, like uh, Christine Lagarde who was running the IMF in the 2010s. And her successor, Kristalina Georgieva, has been accused of corruption uh, in the data collections uh, during her tenure at the World Bank. Prior to that, uh, IMF leaders like Rodrigo Rato went to jail. Uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn had um, many prosecutions. So we're looking at a layer of people that are well, at the bottom of the barrel internationally, but the BRICS keep reappointing them. The BRICS have never put up a unified candidate against them. And the same is with the World Bank. Even when Donald Trump put Donald Malpass, David Malpass, who was a Sinophobe and a climate denialist, the BRICS didn't say anything, even China. Now, this reflects that they go along and they get along in the IMF and World Bank. And they've got usually a high-level position. For example, the uh, chief economist at one point was Justin Lin, a Chinese national. And um, the current uh, deputy uh, managing director of the World Bank for infrastructure is Chinese. But again, we find them doing nothing different. Uh, they go along with the ideologies of the Washington consensus, neoliberalism, and they don't do anything to assist where uh, countries really need a break or where there are genuine reforms being posed. So the idea that the BRICS want to reform the international financial institutions, I dispute based on this record, and it's simple to understand. The most conservative people in our governments in the BRICS countries, especially here in South Africa, are in the finance ministry and uh, reserve bank. Um, you'll find the neoliberal bloc very connected. In fact, our leaders here are often also leaders of IMF committees. Now, these are the sorts of, let's say, um, interrelationships and revolving doors that mean I don't expect uh, the BRICS to lead a progressive reform. In fact, that would be largely regressive what we've seen from the IMF 
and World Bank. Then when we get to alternatives, we had hoped for an alternative IMF called a Contingent Reserve Arrangement, a CRA. It never appeared, even when South Africa needed foreign loans. But even had it uh, appeared, the original declaration in 2014 in the BRICS meeting in Brazil called for 30% quota that you could borrow. But after that, so for South Africa, that's uh, $10 billion total quota, and we could get $3 billion. But then if we want the other $7 billion, first we have to go to the IMF to get a structural adjustment program. In other words, the IMF gets strengthened. Its leverage increases because of this supposed alternative, which doesn't even really exist. We were hoping for an alternative credit rating agency instead of Standard & Poor's, Fitch & Moody's never uh, came to being. We'd hoped for an alternative um, internet because of the US um, tapping in to the wires. Never got that. We were hoping for a BRICS vaccine center, which was promised here in Johannesburg, which would have been so useful uh, two years later when COVID hit, and that never came. In fact, the BRICS were divided. But probably the most confusing is the BRICS New Development Bank. One reason it's confusing is that, the, unfortunately, the BRICS um, have five main members and a few new members like Uruguay and UAE and, and Bangladesh, um, but the, and Egypt is coming in, and probably the new BRICS, Saudi Arabia, uh, Argentina, UAE, as I said, is already in Iran, Egypt in, uh, already in, and Ethiopia. But regardless of what happens, the existing bank with 18% ownership by Moscow suddenly in March 2022 agreed with Western U.S. Uh, financial sanctions against Moscow because they uh, valued more their international credit rating. Um, and then when you look at their portfolio, the BRICS New Development Bank, it really is indistinguishable from a standard international financial institution. Nearly all of the loans are in U.S. dollars, uh, 78%. And Dilma Rousseff, the new president, only wants to bring that to uh, up to um, uh, down to 70% uh, by 2030. They're either dollars or euros or or yen. And um, that reflects that the BRICS New Development Bank is still working under a model in which they borrow from international uh, currency and financial markets and in, in the hard currencies. And then they have to have relatively high interest rates uh, because our currencies are declining. And they really aren't that much different. And in fact, when I looked at the entire portfolio from South Africa, I actually found them to be a more corrupt and less accountable institution than even uh, the World Bank. So I would dispute anyone who would like to say that there's progress, even with someone like Dilma Rousseff, who has great left rhetoric against uh, U.S. imperialism and the dollar. And we saw in uh, August here in Johannesburg, the de-dollarization uh, hype absolutely amount to nothing. There was nothing done except some vague promises that there would be more uh, trade-related uh, currencies. So I hate to say it, but the financial sub-imperial power of the central banks and finance ministries in the BRICS have overwhelmed those um, who I'm sure with all good intent would love to see, and, and we desperately do need, an alternative to U.S. dollar hegemony, but it's not coming from the BRICS. Well, I do want to get back to U.S. dollar hegemony, but while we were on the topic of structural adjustment and World Bank development loans, would you see a lot of these loans, particularly in the case of South Africa, employ Western consultancies or other Western firms to sort of manage and, and implement the strategy of these loans. So in a, in a way, it's you know money laundering, getting money from the World Bank and funneling it through these different consultancies and you know Western firms. And by the time it actually gets to people on the ground, there's not much left. Oh, well, that's correct. I mean, there, there's definitely money that does get into projects, but there's a lot of siphoning. In fact, um, there's a one of these consultancies, PwC, Pricewaterhouse Coopers um, does a biannual survey of corruption, and uh, during the 2010s, our South African white bourgeoisie are yeah, it's color coded because there aren't too many blacks at the top. They rank number one in the world for corruption under the Economic Crime Fraud Surveys, and PwC itself basically was behind wrecking our national airline through corruption. I mean, I really trust them when they do these surveys because it takes one to know one. But the same can be said of Ernst and Young, of Deloitte uh, and Tush. Uh, 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 KPMG might, might be the worst of them, of McKinsey. They've all had notorious roles in stripping uh, South Africa's parastatal agencies who go to them for advice. Um, and yes, there's a lot of funding from the World Bank uh, and, and other uh, international lenders. So it does often feel like it's a, um, an absolute uh, quicksand of international financial and elite corruption and a revolving door that even though our Transparency International rating 
or government corruption is not that bad. We're 100 and most corrupt out of 180. When you have basically the most corrupt corporate elite in the world, from which our own president has emanated, and he's got his own uh, corruption problem at the moment with the uh, apparently millions of dollars cash stuff uh, into a couch, and you're not allowed to hold dollars, um, uh, uh, you know, outside the banking system here. So there's a, a scandal called Palapala, and he himself was in the Maracana massacre as the key investor in Lawnmen, for which the police killed the striking workers in 2012. So we're we're dealing in, a, in an utter swamp or a quicksand of uh, corporate elites who have very weak ethics. And so when we do get IMF and World Bank loans, the latest ones went for COVID. And then you could immediately see how in that process, a great deal of corruption in procurement occurred. It's so bad, Talia, that even in the Treasury, our conservative finance ministry, the main official in charge of procurement, Kenneth Brown, uh, has testified publicly that 35 to 40 percent of every government contract is um, is corrupted by the public-private pilfering, public-private partnerships that are uh, entailing here. And yes, the IMF and World Bank, when they make loans, they don't give a damn about that. In fact, when we took the Madupi loan, in which uh, $3.75 billion went to a coal-fired power plant, Itachi was the main beneficiary, and they bribed the uh, local ruling party, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act was invoked by the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission. Itachi paid a big fine, but the World Bank uh, declined to look at it to see that their loan was massively corrupted. And so we definitely need to be challenging what you could call odious debt, debt that really shouldn't be paid by victims who are electricity consumers, very poor people getting chopped off with very high increases in the electricity price, and by taxpayers. Well, you mentioned President Cyril uh, Ramaphosa, president of South Africa, and he also has ties to uh, the head of the Shanduka group, who was also involved with the the corrupt Gupta brothers as well. So it seems like it's a, a ring of corruption, and we could probably go into more detail on that another time. But I did want to ask you, with regards to the U.S. dollar hegemony and the petrodollar system, do you think the BRICS are, and now with BRICS plus, with the, the new countries that they're letting in, do you think that they're actually capable of de-dollarizing, or is it like is it a question of capacity or the will to do so? Maybe they just don't want to do it. I think it's political will. But before we talk about de-dollarization, just to amplify the point about Asur Ramaphosa has been bound up in corruption. His main partner here for a major coal mine called Optimum was Glencore and its leader, uh, Ivan Glassenberg, until uh, last year when he retired. Uh, Johannesburg raised lad uh, was exceptionally corrupt, and he's you know, been nailed for that by British, um, U.S., and, and Brazilian courts. We, uh, especially in his African dealings. Now the dilemma is that when he did a deal with the Guptas, in which the Guptas tried to shake down uh, Glencourt to get rid of this optimum mine after Ramaphosa, the head of Shanduka had sold it. Um, the crucial question was whether the Guptas could operate a major mining group, and they did so with all kinds of scams. And why BRICS is terribly important in this is that Rosatom, the big uh, nuclear uh, uh, company out of Russia, was trying to sell $100 billion of eight nuclear generators to South Africa using the Gupta's uranium mine. And it was in this context that the prior president basically fell. And it was the extreme corruption. It was so bad the courts actually rejected that after civil society activists from Earth Life Africa and the Green Connection intervened. Now, the main point here is that when we see these sorts of deals involving whether it's Jacob Zuma or Cyril Ramaphosa um, with these BRICS uh, companies, well, we have learned to expect the worst. And expecting the worst for de-dollarization, as I tend to do, I'm a pessimist when it comes to the elites. I, I'm obviously an Afro-optimist when it comes to uh, grassroots social forces. But the main point about um, this de-dollarization is that there are so many ways that um, other countries have shown, uh, for example, Ecuador by defaulting on debts in 2007, uh, Norwegian debts that were corrupt, and then uh, Ecuador throwing out the World Bank and the IMF, or China putting on exchange controls in 2015-16 uh, to keep its own funds inside the country, or the proposal by Hugo Chavez for a Bank of the South um, with the Sucre, the uh, proposed Latin American currency. Many, in other words, many initiatives have been taken to try to weaken existing international financial power relations. Um, and the dilemma about de-dollarization is 
you'd really need a major commitment from the leaders of economies that are diverse, where in one case, India just despises the leaders, despise the Chinese uh, uh, elites. And, and that means uh, not only uh, fighting on the border in the Himal Himalayan mountains over uh, barren strips of land where uh, dozens of soldiers have died, tragedy, but also the Indians have, have begun to repel Chinese capital and they refuse to use the Yuan. Even a, a British enthusiast like uh, Pepe Escobar, a journalist from Brazil, has made this point that really we're looking at elites in the BRICS that haven't yet cohered behind a common project. In other words, financially, it's not that hard. John Maynard King set out the case for national-based instead of international finance uh, for exchange controls and for an international uh, set of relationships that he had hoped would uh, emerge from the Bretton Woods debates. He lost all those debates in 1944 and 1946. Um, and so the terrain we're on isn't foreign. The only things that are probably different would be cyber currencies. And the debate there is whether central banks could be trusted to issue these currencies if they're grounded, for example, in gold. And these are some of the innovations people are hoping for. The best we're going to get in de-dollarization is a little bit more south-south uh, trade financing. But even there, the contradiction is that there's imbalances in the trade. And so India, uh, for example, ex imports a great deal of energy from Russia, but doesn't have much to export to Russia. So there's a huge store of rubles uh, that are, well, rupees from India that can't be turned into rubles because of this trade deficit that India has with Russia. So because of the Indian exchange controls, um, those Russian exporting uh, energy companies are screwed. And that just goes to show that you need real political will to open up uh, what are uh, currently defense mechanisms that I support, exchange controls, but they are preventing a common currency or even these um, trade-related currencies from emerging. What about gold, though? Because China's been heavily investing in gold reserves. Is that them looking to the future and trying to potentially back up a different system using the value of gold? It is curious. And because below my feet here in Johannesburg, at one point, we could find half of the world's gold. Okay, it was all dug out. We just have holes at the moment. At the process, 40,000 uh, miners lost their lives. And uh, it was a terrible, let's say, investment in human life and ecological degradation. The water system here is messed up by all of the uh, chemicals and uh, radioactivity that goes with gold mining. So I'm, I'm quite a critic of the underdevelopment and the resource cursing of gold. So you're asking, you know, in a way, the wrong person, because here in Janusburg, we know the worst cases. Some countries like El Salvador uh, have even banned gold. In Colombia, villages have set no to Anglo-American for gold. So I think gold is a relic of a time when uh, the leading capitalists didn't trust their government. So they sort of said, look, you have to have some grounding for your currency. You need a gold standard. The quasi-gold standard from 1944 until Richard Nixon defaulted in 1971 on the Bretton Woods system meant that the US dollar was measured at $35 to an ounce of gold. And Fort Knox had half the gold and South Africa had a huge amount. And so South Africa and the US fought together against the British in um, and, and all of the debtor countries in these Bretton Woods negotiations. And so since then, since 1971, that stability ended. The gold price has been haywire. It went up very high in the late 70s because of inflation in the US. And it's been zigzagging around. And you're asking a good question. If you buy gold, it's really only as a hedge against what you assume will be a decline in the value of the US dollar, the other major hedge against international financial chaos. And yes, a lot of BRICS and other central banks are buying it, but others are selling it. Um, and one reason is it doesn't get you any interest. It doesn't get you, it just, you know, it's gold vaults, probably sitting in a London central repository. And as we know um, from the Venezuela case, those London uh, managers are, are thieves and they just stole Venezuela's gold stocks. I mean, these aren't even particularly safe ways of, of hedging. The price has been way, way up over $2,000 a ton. Uh, an ounce. But the main point about gold is that because it, uh, under conditions of stability, it'll decline in value. It's not really worth holding unless you do want to set up a new system in which gold is the core to, to assuring everybody you've got value in your currency. But because we're so far away from that, even the BRICS uh, managers think it could be 30 or 40 years. I'm not sure that anyone holding gold is doing themselves any good. But the Chinese are selling a little bit of US treasury bills but they're still keeping their U.S. corporate 
stocks and, and shares, their securities, their uh, credits. So I'm not sure that we're really seeing a dramatic change aside from the one country that did get the sanctions uh, from the SWIFT system and uh, can't get loans and it went into default. And that's, of course, Russia. Now, Russia has, with Iran, a new member of BRICS, that in common. They would love to see an alternative payment system. So I would expect a little bit more progress in, let's just say, the logistical management of trade finance and uh, financial transactions instead of going through this obscure Brussels system called SWIFT. But again, we've been promised this for more than a decade and nothing's happened. So I really, let's say, regret that most of the BRICS negotiators who come from finance ministries and central banks are not particularly um, rigorous in wanting to challenge a system that you know, they're getting used to and that their international uh, corporates uh, are basically needing. They still need to have as much to do with U.S. dollar um, trading and holding uh, U.S. dollars as a, as a safe hedge um, as they can in a period in which we have such extreme volatility. Well, BRICS are now BRICS Plus, so they've just let in a bunch of other countries, including Iran, as you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Egypt, Argentina. And what is the logic in expanding? And also, what you know, what are the requirements for joining the BRICS? I've heard you speak about you know these countries need to be of a certain standing, but clearly, countries like Saudi Arabia have terrible human rights records. So, are those? issues just being swept under the rug? Does that not factor in into letting them in? Well, you asked for the logic, and I don't think there is one. I'd love to know. I think these are, um, uh, let's say, part of the expansion that may, may have been easiest at the outset. Uh, we haven't even heard if uh, Saudi Arabia will say yes. They're kind of playing it, uh, you know, let's see, they're, they're also at the same time negotiating to uh, join the Abram Accords, which would recognize Israel. Uh, so the pressure from the United States to still stay on side, even though Joe Biden called Mohammed bin Salman a pariah, is obvious. And, and of course, when Biden went to try to lower the oil price by uh, raising production, the Saudis said no. And the Saudis also broke the petrodollar earlier this year, meaning they decided they would sell their oil to China in the renminbi, in the international yuan currency. So let's say um, Saudi Arabia's just the subject of an interesting tug of war, um, because as we saw even just weeks ago, they were relatively pro-Ukraine when it came to hosting a peace conference that didn't include Russia. Yet they've also had, you know, Mohammed bin Salman and Vladimir Putin, all sorts of friendly relations. The most important geopolitical relationship for Iran, uh, for uh, Russia, is to bring Iran in because that's the source of, of their drones and other military support but also because there's going to be a north-south trade route that goes from Iran up through to Russia. And these are part and parcel of sort of expanding the Belt, the belt and Road, a horizontal expansion um, uh, currently that would then have a vertical component from uh, Iran up through Russia. So lots of, let's say, contingencies. For example, Brazil, uh, Lula desperately wanted Argentina in, partly to try to persuade the Argentine people that there are benefits from not having a far-right president in the wake of um, Javier Emilio uh, getting, Emilio getting the first, uh, you know, in the primaries, the, the top position in the presidential run. And he has said he will dollarize the currency and uh, not join the BRICS in January if he wins in the October, November uh, vote in Argentina. Ethiopia was a strange choice because it's got a civil, in fact, a double civil war going on uh, with Tigray and Amara. And then Egypt has had this a very strong sub-imperial connection to the United States, of course, as have Saudi Arabia and UAE. So we're looking at six new countries with terribly, let's say, incoherent and diverse approaches. Um, and it just makes you think, what is being good standing all about when we have, for example, popular movements in Iran of women and uh, their supporters uh, rising up and then being literally chopped as uh, executions occur against the uh, the protesters who, who are in solidarity with women who uh, are denied basic rights. Um, the same uh, we can add of Argentine economy with um, a terrible IMF pressure and also gas uh, and oil offshore. Big protests have emerged, anti-austerity and climate a protest called Debt for Climate, a very important movement. Um, and those are the sorts of 
let's say, indicators that all was not well in the new BRICS plus country. And then we'd anticipate a few more coming in. Those that applied include uh, some of the traditional left countries, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, but with big questions emerging about whether, for example, Nicaragua is genuinely left, uh, given the character of Daniel Ortega's rule. But um, then there's potentially Mexico, which could be the biggest and important of Latin America. Uh, coming to Africa, we could expect Nigeria, Senegal, Algeria, and Morocco, who are lined up, but even Sudan and Zimbabwe have asked. In Asia, we'd expect Kazakhstan and probably Belarus, a European uh, uh, Eurasian two crucial countries, and maybe Thailand and um, Indonesia and Vietnam. So those are the sort of, let's say, next couple of dozen countries that we'd anticipate being in the next round, which would be when Russia hosts the BRICS next year. Is there any logic to this? Um, what do the BRICS do to justify attracting all these new countries? It remains to be seen, but as far as I can tell, it's more or less symbolic, and it may reflect this, uh, let's say, underlying geopolitical conflict between the Russian allied uh, countries and, and uh, the West. And if that's the case, then the BRICS don't really seem to have much of a purpose aside from symbolism as to who um, is in the club and who's not. But, you know, ironically, in the club, if all the 24 that had applied this year, that actually would have uh, swung the balance against them because so many of the new countries that I've just mentioned have actually voted against Russia's invasion of Ukraine in several of the United Nations General Assembly votes. It's a fluid situation where the logic isn't particularly evident. Well, we could also flip this good standing criteria on its head and argue that countries in the G7 are not of good standing, especially because the United States is a member. But I think that would be a topic for another interview. Um, but the intrinsic value of the BRICS itself, I mean, to have a forum where countries can debate certain issues without having other Western countries looking over their shoulder. I mean, is there any intrinsic value in that in and of itself, even though we've already established that these countries don't form some sort of anti-capitalist unit? Well, they not only are they not anti-capitalist, if you look at the logic in the single most important block formation, which we've seen so far, it's called BASIC, but it's BRICS minus Russia. That group, Brazil, South Africa, India, China, BASIC, um, came about in 2009 in Copenhagen at the Climate Summit. So they go to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Conference of the Parties, Conference of the Polluters, as we call it, and the UAE, Dubai, is hosting this year. So I do actually anticipate the BRICS now with Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, Egypt, um, major uh, uh, carbon-addicted economies coming and playing a reactionary role. So it's not only that they're not anti-capitalists, that they're pro-fossil. They'll slow down the desperately needed attempts to bring down uh, global uh, CO2 emissions. Um, and moreover, what we found when BASIC negotiated with Barack Obama, to come to your general point that the G7 doesn't have standing in you know good standing to uh, manage the world, we've always seen the G7 economies led by the U.S. and Barack Obama barging into the room in Copenhagen, where Wen Jibao from China, Manmohan Singh from India, Lula de Silva, then uh, as now the Brazilian president, and our former president Jacob Zuma were sitting. It was in December 2009, Obama had just won the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. He jetted over to Copenhagen and there sat with those four and did a deal, the Copenhagen Accord. And the critical thing was to not make emissions cuts top down of the magnitude we need to save the planet. They were very convinced you could do a bottom up, they call it in Orwellian terms, model in which people just made their own pledges. And it's so a Donald Trump then drops out of the UN that we'll see. No big deal. No punishment. Secondly, what they all have in common is that they hate the idea of climate debt. They refuse to accept liability or what we call technically polluter pays responsibility. So the reparations that not just the G7, the major historical emitters, but also China and India and Russia and Brazil, South Africa, five of the major current emitters, and in a few of the cases, also very high historical emitters, and their refusal to accept that they owe poor countries who are really screwed with what they call loss and damage. Um, and they're just not contributing to a fund in the way we would we would want them to. We'd, we'd, we'd love to see a block of uh, emerging markets um, that have power, that have social and ecological responsibility, and that would, like we in South Africa must do, help Mozambicans, hardest hit by cyclones and the climate crisis. 
And it's that dilemma that it's uh, allowing us to say, I think, not Washington nor Moscow, not Washington, you know, and, and, and nor nor uh, uh, Beijing, uh, not Washington, not Delhi, and Pretoria and Brasilia. In other words, we've got a critique that works from a general anti-imperialist standpoint, but then considers, as we do in climate and finance and many other areas. I could also add, uh, you know, World Cup soccer because 2010 we hosted uh, the football World Cup uh, in 2014. It was Brazil. 2018 it was it was uh, Russia. So my case is closed, given Sepp Blatter, the uh, imperialist sitting in Zurich at the time. Um, the sub-imperial, let's say, facilitators or amplifiers of some of the worst tendencies in the system are not going to be a force for liberation. Speaking of liberation, how do you compare the current BRICS to the original non-aligned movement, which formed in 1967 with leaders such as um, Tito from former Yugoslavia, Nasser, um, Sukarno from Ceylon, Nehru from India? How do you I mean, the context was completely different. I mean, this the the non-aligned movement emerged within a context or out of a context of decolonization and, of course, the Cold War. So there are different, you know, contingencies there. But how do you sort of compare the aims of the two? Yes. Well, if you go back to sometimes called the, the Bandung spirit, it was 1955 in which that first non-aligned network from the um, not only uh, the, the South, it was originally uh, Asia and and uh, and. Africa but and, and Latin America came along, of course. But the decolonizations, especially in Africa in the 60s, were supported by NAM. Um, and then Yugoslavia was part of it. But the real question emerged in the 70s with this force, the non-aligned movement, promoting a new international economic order, which would reform, for example, world commodity trades, which uh, create what we would technically term unequal ecological exchange, where uh, values, especially depleted wealth from uh, poor countries then are never compensated at the requisite rate. Now, in all of these unfair international relationships, including Bretton Woods financiers and what was then GATT and now is the World Trade Organization, um, or any of the other um, processes that uh, allow these transfers of wealth from the South to the North, they've actually gotten worse. And as I say, I haven't found, with the interesting exception of the World Trade Organization last year being a site of debate over whether there should be a waiver on intellectual property rights for COVID vaccines. I haven't found that spirit of Van Dung. And then when we saw that uh, attempt, which was led by South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, and joined by Narendra Modi. Now, Mo Modi, of course, representing Big Pharma of the South, which is the generic uh, medicines industry. They're considered the, the drug uh, company, the, the pharmacy of the South. But um, Brazil, led by Jair Bolsonaro, the reactionary, was firmly with international big pharma against the waiver. And for Russia and China, they had the Sputnik and the Sinoparm and Sinovac vaccine. So they didn't come on board with the advocacy for generics. And that cost probably millions of lives and led to a vaccine apartheid where, for example, the very um, unscrupulous leadership of Canada ordered five times uh, the number of vaccines than they had population uh, at the time because they had the best access into the, the, the different circuits of big pharma and some of the, the other um, uh, vaccine systems. And that left, for example, Africa with a very low share of the population getting uh, vaccinated. Now, these are some of the debates about, let's say, access to international public goods, uh, stopping the climate catastrophe, dealing with pandemics by sharing uh, vaccine and uh, treatment information and resources, or trying to address ocean acidification, and plastic, plastification, or the six great species extinction, biodiversity crises, or dealing with global inequality in a systematic way, for example, stopping tax havens and illicit financial flows. This is where you'd want the BRICS to act coherently. And the most important single recent case, trying to get intellectual property waivers on COVID vaccines to stop a pandemic from running out of control, uh, we failed. So I, I don't think at this stage, we can expect these kind of global elites who, who themselves acknowledge that they have a holy crisis, uh, interlocking and overlapping uh, problems. The World Economic Forum uses that term to basically show their own humility at their incapacity. And to have an alternative approach is so desperately needed. But what we've seen, all the evidence we've seen so far, is that the BRICS fit into the system instead of uh, opposing it.
You've just been watching part one of my discussion with political economist Patrick Bond on the BRICS countries. I promise you part two is just as interesting. So if you'd like to support us with a small donation, you can go to our website, theanalysis.news, and hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen. If you haven't done so already, get onto our mailing list via theanalysis.news' website. That way you're notified every time there's a new episode. See you with Patrick Bond for part two.